So welcome everyone um, to this Friday's edition of Create a World. Um, we have sort of a special um, episode that's happening this morning. Um, we are together again as collaborators, which normally we only do that at the end of the month. But um, but the field of Tantra Mat is active, uh, very active with a lot that we're going to be um, presencing this morning. And so um, uh, guided by Tantra, we're here together to have this conversation. And if you're new to Create a World, I just want to give you some context. So um, this is a, a conversation that we have in the field of Tantra Mat. And it's governed um, by the principles of the field, which is that everything operates on behalf of everything else. Everything's part of everything else. Everything is in relationship with everything else. Everything has a place. Everything operates on behalf of life and has us exist as whole. And everything is always moving to the next greater whole. And as a cultural collective here in this field, we are really, we're committed to um, the new futures rising on our behalf and, and the wisdom that we move with in order to, um, to inhabit those new futures. And we always invite you to be in a place of curiosity um, when we're having this conversation. And um, as we are able to get live on YouTube, feel free to, um, to post comments or questions there. Um, but really this, this is a this conversation serves as a container in which you can really explore and discover what is true for you. You'll hear you'll hear us talk about some things that may um, seem contradictory, and we'll say, "Well, for me, it's this, and for me, it's that." And we are inviting you to find your own um, sense in in the midst of our conversation, because you're the only person who can be you. <laughs> I'm the only person who can be be me. Kristen's the only person who can be Kristen. And so we really, um, we, we do this create a world as a way of empowering you to, to live in the being that is you. Um, and um, I think what we'll do is just as we each speak for the first time, we can introduce ourselves really quickly. So I'm Janice Cornetti. Um, I have been one of the collaborators for, um, We've, we've been doing these live sessions for over a year, but we've actually been in development of Create a World for, for a couple of years. Um, and so what we're going to talk about this morning is um, we're going to talk about uh, fear, but in, in the context of something specific. And that is, so, so Tantra Mott, who is the... Um, I'm 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 not sure what the word is she would want me to use, but she's the she's our I'll I'll say our fearless leader, even though she would not want me to use the term leader, but um she's the head source, of source base. Yeah, she is the she is the source base and the and the lead explorer in our um in our um in our journey. So um she is a is a prophet and a mystic and um she received um a prophecy in 2010 am i accurate with that um, no it was it was in 1994 i think 1994 2010 yeah was when sorry another date so so anyway um in that prophecy um she was given you know very very specific communications about things that would happen in our world and the way that how we understand things to be would change. Um, and I think chances are, if you're here this morning, you are very in tune with the fact that 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 reality as we've known it is dismantling, um, that the structures that we relied on are dismantling. Um, I was watching um, an interview between Ocasio-Cortez and, um, and Megan McCain. So welcome everybody, um, now that we're live streaming. <laughs> um, thanks for joining us. Um, we, we ran into a little, some little technical hiccups this morning, but um, we're glad to be live with you now. 
Um, so I'm Janice Cornetti. I'm one of the collaborators and I'm joined by the other collaborators of Create a World. And just again, um, so what we're going to be doing this morning is exploring um, the, the idea of have them not be afraid. And so we're going to talk about what fear is and what fear isn't and, and how we can move in do not be afraid. Um, so, so the idea of this, this prophecy where Tantra got the message, have them not be afraid because um, everything around us is dismantling. And, um, and as I, I think especially for those of us in Western cultures, we're very used to rules and guidelines and structures and containers. Um, I think people that live, um, people that are actually, you know, members of indigenous tribes or people that live in a more indigenous way, um, I think have developed um, strength, stamina, capacity for living outside of those structures. But for many of us in a more Western culture, um, we've, um, the, the structures shape us. So sometimes we like how that is working and sometimes we don't like how that is working. But the reality is that, that the structures have impacted us um, in, in ways, sometimes ways in which we're aware, sometimes in ways of which we're unaware, sometimes ways in which we are actively uh, fighting against. But the simple fact of the matter is those structures are going away. And as those structures are going away, before the new realities have fully formed, we're in this vulnerable place. Um, and I remember talking with Tantra about this years ago and um, telling her that that it made me think of a, of a soft, soft shell crab. Mm. If, you're, if you're not aware of what a soft shell crab is, crabs, you know, they have a hard shell. But the thing is, once the shell is hardened, it doesn't grow anymore. But the crab's body under the shell keeps growing and keeps expanding. So at some point, the crab has to molt the old shell and it has to grow a new one. So it molts the old shell. But the thing is, when it molts the old shell, the new shell, the bigger shell that's underneath is soft. And it actually takes a while for that soft shell to harden so that it becomes protective again for the crab. So there's this space in time where the crab basically has no armoring and thus is having to, you know, be much more careful about, about protecting itself, maybe it's hiding or whatever. But um, so we are, uh, we are moving into <laughs> the time of soft shell crab. And so, so obviously if I'm a crab with a soft shell myself, might be afraid and to hide and sort of thing. Um, but we, <laughs> we as crab people <laughs> are gonna struggle to create our new reality if we, if we stay in the mode of hide. So we need to both be able to be cognizant of, of ensuring our own physical and emotional safety while also being willing to be part of the new futures rising. And so that is the, I would say that the, the challenge before us. And so I wanted to just share a little bit of um, information about fear. And um, because there's actually, when, when we say fear, um, for all of us, there can be lots of different ways that we understand and experience fear. And, and there's actually lots of different emotions that are similar and related to fear, but also have distinctions. And so I just wanted to share a couple of those as we get started this morning. Um, it's from a book called The Field Guide to Emotions. Mm. Uh, and it's, um, so I, I came to this book through some work that I was doing with the New Field Network. Um, and um, and we, the other thing that we've been talking about a lot in the field of Tantramat is this idea of intent versus impact. And so I also want to clarify intent versus impact of fear. So where the where fear comes from um, is the old English 
for calamity, sudden danger, peril, sudden attack. And that's um, so that's pretty consistent through the literature. The idea that if that that when we when we really hone specifically down to fear, um, that it really is related to something sudden and um, in a very um, limited period of time. So our what we tend to think or say to ourselves when we experience fear is something might harm me. With fear, we we are clear what that something is. The saber tooth tiger, you know, back when we were, you know, first evolving as a species. Um, when when a, a mom makes a decision to hold a child's hand as she crosses the street, she's clear that that the fear is that there's cars on the street and she doesn't want her child to run out in front of them and get hit by one. So there's clarity about what the what there is to be afraid of. Um, the, the purpose of fear is to help us avoid danger, which as I'm saying that out loud now, I, I'm feeling a distinction from to keep us safe. So um, fear is specifically to help us avoid danger. But the impact of fear is that it, it tends to close us into ourselves. So if you think about, um, you know, an armadillo rolling into a ball, right? Because the armadillo's got the hard shell on one side, but they got the soft belly. And so they, they close up into a ball so that only the hard parts are exposed. Another um, impact or impulse that can come from fear is that it causes us to avoid. So whatever that danger is, we are looking to avoid that danger. I am going in the opposite direction of the saber-toothed tiger. Or again, I am, you know, as, as if I'm the mom with a little child, I might choose to even cross the street in a different place if I feel like where I'm about to cross is that even if I hold my child's hand, it won't necessarily be a safe experience. So emotions that are related to that are anxiety, doubt, and dread. Um, and the idea with anxiety is that anxiety is experiencing that same fear sensation, but we don't, we're not as clear on what the thing is to be afraid of. And dread is the, is the sort of the what happens before. You know, if you think about something that you want to do and you don't really want to do it, um, like dental work, <laughs> dread would be the oh no, oh no, oh no, that's running before you find yourself in the actual situation of the dental work. And the time orientation of fear is the future. And I think that's also going to be very relevant for our conversation today because we'll make a distinction between what it is to be in the future versus what it is to be here now. And I found this really um, important for this morning. So how this emotion can get in the way. So fear, when it becomes a mood, causes us to be hypervigilant and always looking for possible danger. And from that energy, it's impossible to take risks or stray from a narrow path we consider safe enough. Ways you might know that you're in fear physically is that you might find that your breath is um, shallow and quick. Um, you might feel tightness in your belly, in your chest, in your jaw. I, I tend to feel, feel mine in my soul. And our body, again, our, our bodies tend to go into this, this, this ball shape, right? We tend to sort of close in on ourselves physically when we're in fear. Um, and then I just wanted to share another little bit from, um, from Brene's, Brene Brown's book, Atlas of the Heart. Um, That, that fear arises when we need to respond quickly to physical or psychological danger that is present and imminent. And again, the present and imminent distinguishes it from you know times when we have similar feelings, but for something that's a little bit more um, out there in time. And she also says that we can't forget that we experience social pain and physical pain in the same part of our brain. And the potential exposure to either type of pain drives fear. So 
so that's a little bit about fear. And again, the 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 communication to Tantra was have them not be afraid. So despite everything that's happening that could cause us to be afraid. I mean, I live in Florida. Um, I was south of where Hurricane Ida, I mean, uh, Adelia landed. Um, I'm currently on the other side of the coast from where Lee is coming, but I mean, but so there's these more, um, these more strong, more frequent hurricanes are, seem to be a part of the reality for the immediate future. Um, and yet, if I just curl into a ball, that's not going to help <laughs> if a hurricane actually comes. So, um, so, so fear is in our reality. Um, there are a lot of things that are happening that are not only emotionally distressing, but like where I am in Florida, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of things happening to certain marginalized groups of people that really are putting them not just emotionally at risk, but physically at risk. So, and yet have them not be afraid. So with that, I want to um, open up the conversation and let's talk about how to not be afraid. Hmm. Well, I'll jump right in if that's a per Okay, great. So I don't get the chance to really be with all of you every time. So I feel really honored and thank you for bringing me into this collaboration. Um, I've been kind of in your company watching and enjoying all of the conversations that you have. And um, I think what would dry, what drew me today to, to really want to be here together in this conversation with each of you is um, not only the concept of fear, but also what's on the other side of that and what's just beyond it. So I want to start there. Um, and I and I, I will introduce myself just briefly to let you know, I, I am Kristen Onderdonk. I'm the owner of Enjoy Chi. That stands for Enjoy Life Force Energy, whatever that means for you. Uh, we help people thrive uh, beyond circumstances. And I work with mainly a population of men and women who experience or have experienced deep trauma and are maybe in uh, addiction recovery and use, they have used um, whatever their DOC drug of choice may be, we all have aspects of that uh, that play out. And I get to work with them kind of beyond the systems that they may be in receiving care. So um, I'm a coach, I'm an author, I am a mother, a, deep, uh, a deeply appreciative woman out here uh, thinking deeply about Tantra and how I would describe her for me. Uh, she is a prophetess. And she is an access point for me to my own direct link with creation. So I deeply feel her presence here today in each of us. And, um, you know, we, we've been talking a little bit in the community that we also talk in, you know, not so publicly, but maybe in our other interactions about this word flow that is um, actually the second, the second word in the book that I was downloaded and channeled uh, Stop and Flow, Eight Steps to Recharge Your Life is the name of my book and my process that I was given. Um, and I want to start there with that word flow, kind of as being a placeholder for maybe what's not only beyond fear, but also what gets us to acknowledge fear as a place that we can kind of leap off of and a spark. And that word flow begins with the letter F. And the acronym letter F is feel the spark. And I just want to, I want to read actually a quote that, um, that comes from my boss, actually, since we were talking about how this might come into the conversation and, um, Anais Nin, and I prob I hope I've pronounced that right. Um, the quote is, and the day came when the risk to remain tight in a bud was more painful than the risk it took to bloom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's take a breath with that if we can. And I really invite everyone who's watching this to do the same and feel that, I mean, the butterflies and the, uh, the energy that comes in with that beautiful breath. 
something I'd like to say is, in addition to all of the principles that you named, Janice, in the beginning, everything operating on behalf of everything else and on and on, we operate here, and you beautifully express that when you guys gather, in transparency, vulnerabil vulnerability, intimacy, authenticity, and affinity. And there seems to be a surge that I'm tracking that I pay attention to, a rise, if you will, in breath work, meditation, um, that depth of being able to go within, and positive psychology and positive imagery and all of the beautiful things that are sparks that do tend to set us into the flow. And first, we acknowledge what is also present, which is real fear in any context of how we define it. And I love much of what you said. I love Brene Brown's work as well. Um, for me, I've been playing with and what's been rising is in this Be Not Afraid, which always reminds me, it triggers a song in me. I'm not gonna try and sing it, but the Be Not Afraid, I go before you always, come follow me. I guess I will try and sing it. <laughs> and so um, that fear, we know what fight and flight kind of feel like in our body, the holding of the hand, right? And the the fight, the instinct, the violence really that comes out and is needed. I love the soft shell analogy. I can almost envision that when that shell is coming off and we have no armor, that softness, we would need not only to hide and to flee, but we might need to fight and violence might be something that the shell in us, that softness is not prepared to do, but needs to. And that might grow into our DNA and has perhaps. And also the freeze. So if we look at the first part of my acronym, STOP and FLOW, and I really hadn't really thought this through today, till just about today and in the weeks that we've been playing with this concept and talking about it and other interactions, but that freeze aspect of our humanity then that you know operates there to allow us to play possum, to play dead and not feel the pain and also to feel the spark when we get that opportunity to get the hell out of there. And, and want to choose life. Um, that aspect of stop, I think, is really rising in our world in various ways. For me, I see it in meditation. I see it in the ability for people, men and women who have experienced deep trauma and are still using their DOC, their drug of choice, or using whatever they are to escape or to run or to hide. They are able to come into that place of stillness in lots of ways and lots of techniques that are embedded in you know, the process as I was giving it. But I'm seeing that happening elsewhere as well, naturally. Uh, yesterday, for example, I stopped over to visit my two, my three, uh, two nieces and one nephew just to bring them some food. I have family all over the place here and locally. And I showed up and they all wanted five minutes with me. I'm Aunt Cuckoo to them. And, you know, they just all want five minutes with anybody, but especially with Aunt Cuckoo because I'm weird and I talk their language still. So, we did we navigated that and I, I i left there feeling like you know what there was a lot going on it was like this tug of war they were all afraid they weren't going to get their five minutes they were kind of fighting and, and really literally tackling and wrestling as little kids do and i i was frozen in the in the few minutes that i had with them as this beautiful place and i got home kind of fearing did i give them enough in that five minutes you know was i still enough was i present enough to them that's fear too. I mean, that's real. Like, am I enough? There's a lot. That's, that's an aspect of us. So the meditation piece and the breathing place, I'm like, wow, let me, let me think about that. Immediately, the universe responds with a text message and an image of my nephew. Mm -hmm. He drew a picture on his door of him meditating, like a stick figure. I wish I had, I, I really wish I could show it. But, and then, he, then I get a video from my, my sister-in-law. Well, Aunt Cuckoo strikes again. And there's, there's Pitt. Patty, as we call him, um, in his little video. And she sent it to the family thread. And then a cousin responded with her little boy who was sitting meditating. Now, I find that interesting that we're tracking stillness. The freeze response gives us a lot of power when we lean into it. And it's only in the storytelling or in the symptoms, actually, that result from the freeze when we're in freeze that give us problems afterwards because that power in the freeze and the stop and the stillness and the meditation state and the whatever techniques get you there to drop in give us a lot of power 
And I think that's what we're playing in this conversation. Like what we really, I, I, I posit that um, we're rising with it and elsewhere it's rising and it's being talked about and being cherished and it's beyond religion and it's beyond philosophy and it's beyond, you know, like the prophecy that you spoke of was that the three world religions need to complete and uh, be not afraid in that process. It's gonna, it may look not comfortable. It may look scary and be not afraid because this is not on you and trust however that shows up for you in higher power go within trust and when you feel the spark to get on out there and move and to be with light let yourself move that's the l observe the clarity of where we are now observe and then ask ourselves again as humanity wakes up to this notion where am i now and am I not more powerful when I'm in that connection and that flow that's just beyond fear that gives fear a place as well? I think that's the 4D. You know, I, I, I think that's, um, I think that's pretty cool. I think you guys are pretty awesome for like boldly, bravely opening your mouths and start talking about all this stuff every week. And, um, and I think with that, I'm complete. So thank you for having me in part of the conversation. Great. Thanks. I want to. I want to add. I'm sorry, Janice. You started. Do you want to go? Okay. I, I want to add to what you all have presents. I really appreciate it. That because I'm Deborah Merchant. I'm. Some people call me Doctor Deb. <laughs> it, and I, um, my company is the Vital Psyche, and I've worked with clients that, you know, fear is well beyond the physical like everything you named janice is so concisely beautifully said and and i would agree with you there i want to add though the existential the the fears that come from beingness the fears that come from belonging the fears that come from trauma <clears throat> is a notch up those are way less tangible. In traumatic stress, you can see the symptoms or in the kind of uh, people that Kristen's talking about, you can see the symptoms more easily. But in our Western culture, those are considered symptoms of something not working in the person. They're not regarded as symptoms of what to be afraid of or what is activating fear like the person is broken or it's a medical model a diseased model and um the social structures that you referred to in Brene Brown's book um the the different ways we relate to each other that are not life enhancing there's a lot of interpersonal activity that results in fear that results in um where do i belong how do i express myself how do i move to you know i have this vision for who i am and what my purpose is how do i move to that and i do think that there are maybe somewhat invisible structures but structures that would rather keep us uh where we were i like the i help me with it please janice because i've already forgotten what you said the poem from that nelson mandela made famous it's not our darkness we're afraid of it's our light and getting to that point of light that's a can be a very fearful place those are the kinds of fears that um, can also take us out. And, you know, keep when, what I mean by that is keep us from um, achieving that next level of uh, beingness that can keep us from presencing whatever gift is moving through us. The, the fears that come with being and belonging, they're not visible, they're not concrete or not that easily. And I think those fears are uh, 
just as potentially dangerous and difficult as the ones that you referred to, Janice. So I'm adding that in the mix. And elements like uh, activities like the stop and flow, like using the templates, listening to music, um, improving communication techniques, and, and communicating well with each other. There's things that are not glamorous that may seek. Sorry, Kristen, I didn't mean that about your, <laughs> your stop and flow at all. I'm sorry. And the um, there's a lot that may seem ordinary. It, it's not going to be this big, dramatic movie kind of phenomenon, but it keeps us from the impact of fear. It keeps us from the um, result of fear keeping us dampened down or unable to respond as, you know, the social structures that we're currently in that you know, for me, I also agree with Janice that they're dissolving. And we're the ones whose ancestors put them in place. And the Hopi prophecy of we're the ones we've been waiting for, at least a part that I understand of that, is we're the ones who are forming the new ones. So fear may have a place like identifying it's there what does it mean okay it means it you know i shouldn't rise to here i should stay here whatever it is but then we're the ones who have to decide or choose are we bound by that the definitions and the unseen that come with those fears or are we going to go beyond and how do we get there? So that's what I wanted to add to the conversation about uh, fear. And we're, I say we're succeeding. I say that adage of life will find a way is true. And that there's many, many avenues to um, overcoming fear. Fear does not, as horrible as it can be, and as paralyzing as it can be, I have, there are not, it, it's not as powerful as it would have us believe in my estimation. So I think I'm complete for now. Thank you. I love this different exploration of different kinds of fear. And I think by us kind of pulling them apart and delineating them, it's easier to recognize it. To me, when the physical feel, like I don't like to go in mountains alone because there's mountain lions there and my like little slow moving old ladies, <laughs> it's lunch. <laughs> and so I think, oh, maybe I won't go by myself. Um, and I think that's probably a wise thing to do. So there's fear about at that level and there's the fear that, that Deb's been talking about and the other two talked about that I think is more prevalent now is because everything's in flux, you can't, we can't say, oh, I know what the next day will be like. I know what my role will be. And my biggest fear is, is, is that it's like, how does this work out? Because there is no template. There is no hard shell to the crab anymore. And, and so when it's one thing to say, oh, okay, I've got fear about something and I don't know what it is. And then to be able to step outside of yourself and say, be the observer and go, okay, what's going on? What are the things that will help me get out of the physical sensation so I don't get caught in it? And that's the stop and flow, that's meditation. It's that kind of anything that will calm us and center us and ground us. And it's from the grounding position that I get a little bit more <laughs> viewpoint. And sometimes I hear like my fear voice says, I've always told you this, and it repeats an age old thing that my system has been telling me. And in my case, it's, you're never gonna get through. You can lead people through it, but you will not get through yourself. And I think there's, 
there's a very not very nice whatever in, in my life who's been telling me that because it guides how I act. So I have to sit back and go like, okay, is that really true? Probably not. Don't know why that's an ongoing phrase, but it gives me a sense of objectivity, a moment of calmness. And so I can still say, well, what am I to do? Where am I to spend my time? That feels like it's moving. I'm not in a stagnation position. And yet it's not directional. And I think one of the things that certainly I was trained to all my life is know your goals, you know, <laughs> get those, you know, checkoff lists and you'll know you'll get to the end. Well, that's a bunch of baloney to be quite true, right? <laughs> we don't know. We don't know where our actions are going to take us. And I think then that's where, again, fear comes in. Okay, I don't know it. Well, the good news is, is that we're not supposed to know it. You're not supposed to have, if we're really moving with creation, with time as it moves in its own configuration, there's no way that you would know exactly what you're going to be doing in the next hour, the next day, the next month. We know that there's a certain stability in the world. And we know that our place and the path that we walk will probably be new. So it's the you know, the stepping outside of it that say, okay, I get it. What I'm supposed to do is pay attention to the moment, be everything I can be in the moment, be as true to who my core is and know that creation's on my side, that I'm not going to be led into a fire pit. You know, I'm not going to be led into, you know, waving goodbye to everyone and left by myself. <laughs> Um, so it has to do more with that faith and that present orientation to say, I don't, there is no way I would know what the future would be. I don't know, but I can every moment choose something that, um, feels right and integrous for the moment. One of the things I've started to do, there's a thing called story worth that my son and daughter gave me. And they give you prompts and you write stories about your childhood. And, and I have put it off all year. Me who loves to write, I put it off the whole year. And here I am. And I said, I'm going to write that every day. Because in the writing of that, it orients me to the past. And in orienting me to things of the past, it orients me to my values. And that orients me to how I act in the world, no matter what. And I think that's how we work with fear. I think fear is a friend. When I, when I was young and I was in training and we had all sorts of things that we taught people, they said fear is fantasy experienced as real. And if we can say that's really interesting, why would, why would that happen? But but the, my sense of it now to get out of, because I, I have been triggered really strongly by this shift in what's going on and where am I and what are we doing? Where am I going? I've come to that stance that if I'm just present in the moment, knowing that I would never be guided to do anything that would injure me or harm me, then, then the fear just stands off to the side. And isn't a controlling factor. Can I respond to that? Actually, am I, you guys hear me? Okay, great. I'm going to respond to that. Let's say it that way. So <laughs> I really, um, one thing, the glamorous, I think that's the reason why we don't do what we're going to, because I love that. It was like a compliment when you said stop and flow is not really that glamorous or what, and that, it's a compliment because these are the reasons we don't do these things because they're so simple sometimes. That's just one thing I want to say. I take that as such a compliment and why we all need to lean into the, maybe the less glamorous uh, for me. And the, what, when you were saying, Electra, that voice and the, gosh, I call it the itty bitty shitty committee. And if my daughter, and I write about that in the book, and my daughter who helped me edit and process some of the information will cringe now and tell me that that's 
something about a bra company I, and it's not even the right slogan, but for me, that's how I hear it. The itty bitty shitty committee. And we all have one of those running. I have it all day long sometimes. And I feel I count that as violence against myself, mm -hmm. harm, harm against another, no different than that violence I bring against myself. And with that, when I heard you were talking, when, when you presenced that, it really brought me back into, um, <sighs> Tantra was also expressing about how the uh, she was hearing Jesus weeping in a way that she deep, the deepest grief. And I want to presence that, that the words that she heard from Jesus were, we tried so hard to remove the violence from as many of them and of yourselves and so few could survive. Probably don't have that exactly, exactly accurate. If you want to clean that up, please feel free to. But I think that that subtly kind of brings in this need for where fear, fear as my shield, like there are places I walk through this world where I need that field. Mm -hmm. And I do the best I can to train and we do, I'll do our best to kind of do that with as minimal loss of life as we can, is my goal. And then there are those other subtle places in my day that I hear that itty bitty shitty committee telling me, harm yourself, violence again, you can't do this, you're not enough. And every one of the people I work with hears that a lot as well mm -hmm. and yet we can trust we can trust that that is not in all of ourselves and i mean there may only be a few of us here that actually are moving with that i will not take action on that i will i will be strong like i will find maybe the less glamorous ways i will find ways i will seek out fellow humans that don't want to harm themselves or another and I'm sensing that that's rising very much so with the prophecy in our times. I want to say one last thing, and then I'm going to pass it over to you, Deb. So I think a lot about the world religions and how I really only knew one of them and also felt affinity to the other two as a child, but was really kind of patterned into Christianity, Christianity. And it never landed for me as but I love those other friends of mine who are Jewish and I don't get this. And I also really, really like the, these Buddha type figures. And you know, the, as a child, these messages never added up. And more and more, I think people are coming into that wholeness of like listening to that other voice inside of us that says something's just not adding up in all this. So I'm exploring this. And I think that for me, as I tie back to a deep connection to Christianity and Jesus and the Marys and the women, when I think about the people and what they were doing on the mountain, as you mentioned, going fearfully into mountains, I don't traverse those either. But I would have, I think that we were looking, the feminine in all of us was looking beyond the fear and the horror of what was really going on on the cross. And in that story that I say, you know, that we carry that ability to lean into flow and to look beyond and to take ourselves to the place that is salvation, grace. And I, I, I would say that if I was Jesus that I died, and I died on the cross, I would be very sad weeping and grieving that I didn't get to stick around to see what other wonderful things were happening as well. The placeholders of the time took that attention with intention and compassion and led that story forward. And with that, I am complete. The part I want to really respond to is on the, the less visible, the non-concrete activators of fear the social the uh the places where we're violent towards ourselves and others the the places where being and belonging all of those we wouldn't know them as fearful we wouldn't have we wouldn't resist those conditions existing if we didn't have a deep inner knowing of not that all of us carry a deep inner knowing of what's whole and beautiful and life enhancing and the most real, whether we get at it from a faith-based or spirit-based place or some other place, whether we've got the niggly and can't put words to it and use what we refer to in, in these creative world, the, the templates, it's a beautiful uh, process simple beautiful and not so simple 
process to get us to our that known place or stop and flow or other forms of meditation or guidance of whatever type and the repetitive use of those tools whatever they are is what allows us to uh, not have fear and the life defeating energies rule and it lets us get to what we know is the truth of, of life enhancing beautiful strong whole places those can't live though those structures that keep the fear-based stuff in place have to crumble as the others rise and that's what's happening it's not and it's going to be messy structurally socially what whatever ways it's going to be messy but i wanted to really presence that what you sparked there Kristen. Even the people recovering from substance abuse, from, from other forms of, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not saying that right. Non-substance abuse, traumatic stress places, w- whatever it is that people are reaching beyond, we wouldn't reach beyond if we didn't know other somehow. That's what I'm trying to say. Thank you. I'm complete. We're coming up on the top of the hour, so I want to make sure that Victoria and Liz, if you have anything, chime in. But but real quick, I just want to say, and Deb, what I think is so important about that is for us to recognize that 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 messy is life. <laughs> life is messy, um, and and mess mess is incredibly fertile, right? Yeah. So I, that's part of what we're talking about this morning is that is that yes, things are gonna be messy, but that doesn't mean bad. And so we don't we don't necessarily have to fear devolution. We can just be, we can just recognize that we're being in devolution while also being in evolution. Yeah. And it's one of the places that's crumbling. Somehow there's a, maybe I'd call it a meme, a thought structure that's just invisibly in the air in our Western culture. If you're a good person, if you're doing things right, if you're spiritual enough, then everything will be that lovely happily ever after and not messy. And that's not real, never has been real. And now we are finding that, and I'm not very good at messy sometimes, really. I'm just now beginning to accept the the joy and beauty in that. So thank you. Victoria or Liz, anything for you as we come up on the top of the hour? Um, So many wonderful things have been said. The thing I'm called to say is um, just what I've been in experience with uh I'm Liz Geyer I'm one of the collaborator collaborators for our creative world and um kind of my corner of collaboration is uh in the field of education working with young people um and in working with uh helping my students move through their own fears of that they are not enough because they Mm -hmm. don't understand um, or feel they're not smart enough or whatever to learn to use that fear. We used to say in working with the nurtured heart approach, use that fear as rocket fuel Mm. to move you out, sort of like a cannon kind of blowing you out out of it and and not to dismiss it not to dismiss it you know what did i hear one of you say fear is my friend but to to work with it um to be with it but to use it as fuel so uh because because it's healthy uh, fear is healthy (laughs) so um i think that's my that's my main message that I'm working with right now. 
Use it as fuel to move you into the next, whatever the next is for you. I'm complete. Oh, um, I would say this topic is so beyond one hour and what I would want to talk longer than our time. So what I, what I want to presence mostly is the soft shell crab. Mm. And I'm a Gemini with a cancer rising. So I look at both sides of the either or, and then I rise through the feeling, emotion to move into the next greater whole of my being. So I know, I know this being with fear, with any emotion as a part of my nature. And that's why I love the idea of the crab. And I know I do this like crabs do. They go sideways. They sidle up next to you mm -hmm. and prod you a little to say, what about? And I think that's what fear can do for us too, is if we let it sidle up next to us. And, and so we may not befriend it in some moments, but we're with, as the friend is with us side by side, walking our paths as we are vulnerable and we're authentic to ourselves and we're transparent in the moments when it's upon us. We've got somebody nudging us to be courageous. And that's what fear has done for me in my life is it's given me the courage to keep moving forward as I develop the next shell and being vulnerable means I'm stepping into developing the next shell and being fiercer than I was the day before. I'm complete. Thank you, Victoria. So we've come to the end of our hour and I agree with you, <laughs> Victoria. It, it flew by way too quickly, but, but do know that we do plan to have um, deeper and expanded conversations about this because it is, um, it is very rich, it is very up, um, and, um, and we know that there's a lot more to explore. So um, thanks for being with us today and we'll look forward to um, being with you next Friday and all the Fridays moving forward. Mm -hmm. And thanks everybody for being part of the conversation today. Yeah.